The Disney Renaissance was a period of time when Disney animation was revived from a failing studio to a creative and financially successful juggernaut. Wait, wait, this isn't the story about that, right? No, this is the tale of how it all ended. The Emperor's New Groove spent over four years spinning its wheels until an opposing vision forced an 11th hour restart. Now it's known as a comedy cult classic. Hell yeah, it is. But then, it signaled the end of an era and was Disney's most embarrassing shit show. Get up. The Jungle Book, 1967, the last animated film produced by Walt Disney himself. Without his leadership, Walt Disney Animation Studios fell into chaos. Going through the motions, film after film, the magic was gone. By the 1980s, the company was about to be bought out and stripped for parts. Roy Disney, Walt's nephew, brought in Michael Eisner as CEO in a last ditch effort to turn things around. Just as Disney hit rock bottom with the Black Cauldron, the misguided and wildly over-budget film of 1985 couldn't even get halfway to breaking even. Things needed to change. Eisner appointed Jeffrey Katzenberg to head the film division, with animation being of the utmost importance. Despite having no experience in the medium, Katzenberg ruled with absolute authority. Ruthless and decisive, he demanded perfection. For only spending an hour or so each week at the studio, he bred a dog-eat-dog -dog environment where everyone should be willing to die for their work. And with Eisner breathing down their necks about cutting costs, you either rose to the challenge or you needed to find another job. It was callous and savage, but the results spoke for themselves. The Little Mermaid in 1989 was their biggest film in 20 years. Beauty and the Beast was the first animated film to be nominated for Best Picture. Aladdin was the first animated film to make over $200 million. And in 1994, The Lion King was a legitimate cultural milestone. It became, and still remains, the highest grossing traditionally animated film of all time. Katzenberg resurrected Disney animation. And that's when he quit. He was passed over for a promotion because Michael Eisner and Roy Disney grew tired of his showmanship and desire for full credit. Katzenberg convinced Steven Spielberg to establish a new studio together, DreamWorks, and they poached a great deal of Disney's animators. Quality at Disney Animation almost immediately dropped. The following production, Pocahontas, took a sharp dive in reception and was criticized for its nearly flawless historical accuracy. The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 96 was the harbinger for a massive leap in production costs. Hercules disappointed, Mulan was a step up, as was Tarzan, but the film's skyrocketing budget hardly made it worth it. An audience's growing fascination with computer animation didn't help thanks in large part to Disney's own co-venture, Pixar. Was traditional animation or Disney's legendary studio done for? Despite being a worldwide smash, The Lion King's production was fraught with issues. Original director George Scribner spent nearly a year making a heartfelt documentary-like film. But when Katzenberg forced it to be a musical, Scribner couldn't get behind the change and was fired. Co-directors Rob Minkoff and Roger Allers were then tasked with saving the film. And that they did. Even though it was a musical, they were still able to hit incredible emotional beats. Simba's desperate attempts to wake his dead father was a moment that Allers fiercely defended to keep in the movie, and rightfully lauded for. So immediately after finishing the film, Allers was given a project of his own, and Disney had high hopes. The studio was looking into ancient South American cultures for their next setting, and Allers loved the visuals of the Incan culture, of a city in the clouds. He dove into their myths and was inspired by a god who created the sun by pulling in a distant star. Combined with Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper, Allers' story centered on the selfish emperor Manco, voiced by David Spade, who swaps places with a lookalike peasant, Pacha, played by a then-unknown Owen Wilson. The sorceress, Yzma, a very game Eartha kit, capitalizes on the situation by transforming Manko into a mute llama and coercing Pacha into her evil plan of banishing the sun, which she believes robbed her of her beauty, by summoning the god of death. The movie was big, to say the least. 
not to mention Pacha's romance with the Emperor's fiance, Manko learning humility and love from a female llama herder, a 10,000 year old rock helping Yzma, and the grand finale of Pacha lassoing the sun back into position. Allers was swinging for the fences. Kingdom of the Sun kicked off at the tail end of 1994. But what started as a prestigious project from Disney's new Golden Boy, morphed into an overly elaborate concept crushing under the weight of its own ambition. It wasn't coming together, even though there were pieces that showed great promise. As Disney grew worried, there was a frequently used phrase among the studio, remember the Lion King. As if to say, don't disturb the genius at work. That said, things were going to get even more complicated. Starting with The Little Mermaid, Disney clearly tapped into something by hiring Broadway talent to write their songs. But they took it a step further. Why have radio ads when you can have a chart-topping ballad? The combination of Elton John and Lion King turned out to be a gold mine. So hiring popular musicians became the norm. Bette Midler, Christina Aguilera, Phil Collins, Michael Bolton. This is the tale of Captain Jack Sparrow. What? This time around, Allers asked Gordon Matthew Thomas Sumner, AKA Sting. Sting saw what Elton had achieved and was excited by the challenge. Once he agreed in July of 1997, his wife, Trudy Styler, asked if she could film the experience as they went along. Fearing that Sting didn't understand how rocky the animation process would be, Disney figured that if Styler was documenting it all, Sting would stick it out. With his writing partner, David Hartley, Sting got to work on six songs. Sting joined at a bad time. Producer Randy Fulmer started pressuring Allers to make some serious changes. To help, Fulmer reached out to Mark Dindle to be Aller's co-director. Dindle had worked as an effects animator with Allers on Little Mermaid, before leaving Disney to direct Cats Don't Dance for Turner Feature Animation. See, the studio was collapsing in the midst of a merger with Warner Brothers that was going to- Uh, <laughs> hi, excuse me, two seconds here. Um, can we stay focused? This story is about Disney, not Warner Brothers. Okay, you got it? Let's move ahead. Sorry to slow you down. <laughs> Point is, Dindle saw the writing on the wall and gladly came back to Disney. Together, Allers and Dindle attempted to restructure Kingdom of the Sun. Yet any alterations undermined the song Sting had already written, whether it was removed characters or general themes. Sting was losing patience with Allers. I'm telling a story. And what you've done here, you've taken out the two lines that encapsulate the whole thing for me. <laughs> and that's bad. Ultimately, Allers was committed to too many pieces and he struggled cutting any of it. To him, remove one piece and it all fell apart. To Disney, put it all together and it didn't add up to anything. Allers wanted to honor a culture. Disney wanted an audience pleaser. President of Feature Animation Peter Schneider and Vice President Thomas Schumacher didn't want to control Aller's vision, but not forcing changes perpetuated a lack of progress. Four years in, a third of the film roughly animated, Schneider and Schumacher held a screening and it didn't go well. For me, so much of the movie isn't working. I just don't know who I'm supposed to care about, what I'm watching. The pace seems really, really wacky, like just so, Latin, and I'm not having much fun. What they did like were the quick and funny sequences that Dindle had directed. They asked him for some thoughts on how to fix the film and liked what he had to say. Suddenly Disney was questioning the viability of Allers ever delivering. Allers got feedback from the other directors at the studio and he started to make some changes. So he requested a six month extension to refocus. Michael Eisner would not hear it. Disney was committed to multiple merchandisers, key among them, of course, was McDonald's Happy Meals, and a delay would cost millions. Plus, on top of all of this, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Eisner's now mortal enemy, seemingly stole the setting for the film and ordered DreamWorks Animation to beat Disney to release. The top brass marched into Fulmer's office saying they had two weeks to come up with a solution or they would ax the whole film. Schneider and Schumacher decided to split Allers and Dindle into two teams and give them those two weeks to pitch their ideas of how to save this sinking ship. It was a bake-off, plain and simple. Katzenberg, rightly or wrongly, would say, okay, we're doing Pocahontas, it's Dances with Wolves meets Romeo and Juliet. We're doing that. The bake-off was more about indecision in the ranks. There was a lack of executive leadership that could just say, we're doing this and then we're doing that. 
And just like that, the Kingdom of the Sun team was competing against each other instead of supporting their director. Feeling like kids with divorced parents, they admired Aller's passion and skill, but they knew the film was a lost cause. Meanwhile, they thoroughly enjoyed the creativity happening with Dindle. And adding unneeded pressure was a documentary crew who were very interested in zeroing in on the personal struggles of everyone involved. Two weeks later, Allers pitched his solution, but it was still a big, complex drama with heavy themes. Dindle, on the other hand, suggested a complete overhaul. Along with storyboardist Chris Williams, they pitched a much simpler story, but most importantly, one that leaned almost entirely into comedy. During Allers' pitch, Schneider and Schumacher sat quietly. During Dindle's, they laughed uncontrollably. Allers knew the decision before it was made. Probably, you know, one of my biggest faults was to try to pull all these different elements here, and maybe I tried to hold on to too many ingredients or something. I don't know. I sort of feel like I'm standing here with, like, fragments of my confetti falling through my fingers. It's, it's I mean, uh, I don't know. I was up half the night just sort of grieving over this whole thing, I, you know. With Pocahontas and Hunchback as slight setbacks, Disney wasn't sure that operatic grandeur was the key to past successes, and there was a real fear that their films were becoming formulaic. On September 23rd of 1998, Dindle was promoted to director and given the green light to start over. Dindle apologized to Allers, saying this was never his intention, and asked Allers if he wanted to stay on as co-director. Allers couldn't bear to do it. Though he felt no ill will towards Dindle or the others, he wanted to move on, and joined Lilo and Stitch's production. Schneider and Schumacher told Eisner their plan, but to restart the project, Dindle would need pre-production time to settle the story and determine new character designs, background styles, and the like, which ironically would still delay the film the six months Allers asked for. Eisner gave them the extension. Kingdom of the Sun was moved from the summer of 2000 to Christmas. However, to fill the release date, the incredibly beleaguered production of Dinosaur was forced to move up, compromising that film's quality. Pushing Kingdom to December also allowed further distance from the March release of DreamWorks' The Road to El Dorado. A certain Katzenberg-produced film also set in pre-colonial South America with music by Elton John. Dindle and his team looked at what they liked about the current film. David Spade, Earth the Kit, and an Incan prince learning humility after turning into a llama. Yay, I'm a llama again! Wait. Literally everything else was thrown out. No more romances, no retelling of myths, no more most of the cast. Now it was just a buddy road comedy between a now older fatherly Pacha and Manco, who was renamed Cusco. Yeah, why did they change Manco? I think it means, um, in Japanese. And that's not what bothered him. Um, it means bad movie in Turkish, and they didn't want that. Now titled The Emperor's New Groove, Dindle had 18 months to produce every inch of a new film. He asked David Reynolds to make the movie funnier. Reynolds was currently a script doctor for Disney, but he was also a staff writer on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. So with Dindle, Chris Williams, and Randy Fulmer, the sense of humor in the room was dialed up to 11. It also meant meetings would evolve into 45 minutes of screwing around followed by 15 minutes of truly concentrated creativity. Their rush timeline meant oversight was rare at best, so they adopted an anything-goes attitude. They had streamlined the film so immensely, it allowed them to string together a series of ridiculous sketches just for the fun of it. And their new character, Kronk, became a sounding board of their weirdest ideas. Oh, he's doing his own theme music? They would get excited about a new bonker sequence, repeatedly pull in the actors, and hand them a few pages. A full script was never written out. The four main cast members were actively encouraged to improvise, to the point they weren't even sure what the movie was anymore. One of the reasons for the studio's history of success was Walt Disney's focus on story rather than gags. It set them apart from the absurdness of Fleischer, Looney Tunes, and Hanna-Barbera. Each film maintained a truth to its characters and setting. A verisimilitude, if you will. 
and they rarely deviated from that, the genie in Aladdin being a rare exception. And here was Emperor's New Groove, where squirrels make balloon animals and trampoline salesmen exist in the 13th century. They recruited Adam West for a manic scene involving an army of scarecrows. Those four months of work went right out the window when Disney nixed it as too insane. They even discussed using actual footage of a space shuttle launch to see how far they could push it. But what does that have to do with me? No, no. He's got a point. That's where they drew the line. $40 million later, Fulmer was ordered to produce some real results. From the outside looking in, Eisner saw a bunch of children wasting the company's time and money. Yet in reality, Dindle was making a lot of headway. Their first screening was a resounding success. This group may have come in with reduced expectations. <laughs> oh. I had no idea what I was walking into. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Even I had no idea. What a great surprise. It was a yeah. great surprise. After you've gone through this long, black, dark tunnel, then, then you can really appreciate how great, great of a moment this was. After 10 minutes or 15 minutes, Peter and Tom say, well, we've said everything we need to say. We're, we're going to take off. Keep going. I've, I've never experienced anything like that before. Oh, yeah. It's all coming together. Oh, yeah, and Sting. Dindle's revamp plans meant all of Sting's songs made no sense in the context of the new film. Obviously furious, he felt the movie's new direction was below him, as he much preferred Aller's philosophical version. He did eventually provide two songs, one during the credits that is a stark contrast to the film that preceded it, and another that ended up being sung by Tom Jones. Despite all that, the final straw for him was the ending of the film. Cusco's original goal is to demolish Pacha's home to build a theme park. At the end, he decides to relocate it to an adjacent hill. The staunch environmentalist Sting thought it undermined the movie's only remaining moral. I've been aware for a while now that my vision of the world and Disney's may be at odds. I can only be candid, but there's something intrinsically faulty with this film, and I find it very difficult to continue working on something that goes against my beliefs. I offer my views humbly, and I look forward to your response. Your sincerely, me. Disney and Dindle agreed, questioning how they didn't think of it first, and made the alteration to the ending. Following a last-minute composer reshovel, which was par for the course at that point, it was a mad dash to finish the film in time. But they did it. The Emperor's New Groove released on December 15th, 2000. Disney didn't know how to market the film, and chose to spend most of that budget on 102 Dalmatians. Both films ended up getting slayed by Jim Carrey in How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Costing a baffling 100 million, and very little of it on screen, Emperor's New Groove bombed. Reviews were great, with most okay with the belly laugh substituting the usual Disney ambition. However, the year was rough for Walt Disney Animation Studios. Their more experimental films Fantasia 2000 and Dinosaur barely broke even. Then their flagship production of New Groove failed. It was the nail in the coffin. The renaissance was over. The studio fell once again into a dark period. Roger Allers, Mark Dindel, Randy Fulmer, Peter Schneider, Tom Schumacher, and even Michael Eisner would all leave shortly after. And it would be 10 more years before they made another mega hit. Chiefly because Pixar's John Lasseter and Ed Catmull took over. Trudy Styler's documentary, The Sweatbox, which chronicled New Groove's six-year journey, debuted at Toronto International Film Festival in 2002, and was immediately buried by Disney. Perhaps dreading its unflattering look at the creative process, the film now only exists in pirated form. Looking over the studio's legendary feature film history, Emperor's New Groove was like a record scratch. It wasn't a romantic fable, it was a wacky farce. More Chuck Jones than Walt Disney. In a way, it was ahead of its time. It signaled a change for animated films, from the Shakespearean dramas to heartfelt slapstick comedies. A trend that absolutely continues today. And for the generation that grew up on it, it has Kronk, the greatest henchman ever, plus all the best memes, and we don't care if it bombed. It's a certified cult classic. Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> 